name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge. And also, they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to We Need to Talk About on GB News with me, Alex Phillips, where we get stuck into the big issues that need looking at in depth. Nothing is off the table and no one will be cancelled for saying what they think. Keeping me company today is former Labour advisor and writer Scarlett Maguire and here's what we've got coming up on the show. It's off the rails again as commuters face disruption across the UK as 45,000 rail workers go on strike in a dispute over pay and pensions. And as an off-gen board director quits over the energy price cap hike, which will see bills soar this winter, will anyone do anything to stop plunging a fifth of families into poverty? Plus, A-level results are out, but with grades lower than the past two years. But is it really a disaster for those with dodgy results? We get some top advice. And the EU is hosting talks between Kosovo and Serbia's leaders amid escalating tensions. We'll be discussing whether this could potentially turn into the next big conflict. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. But do join in, email your views at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnewsfirst, though. It's time for GB News headlines. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past two. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Top grades for A-level results in England, Wales and Northern Ireland have fallen since last year. They do, however, remain higher than pre-pandemic levels, the last time students physically sat exams. Meanwhile, the number of students accepted at university or college is also falling, according, according to UCAS, but it's still the second highest rate on record. Education Secretary James Cleverley says there's support in place for students following the results. We wanted to get the grades back towards the kind of levels that we saw pre-pandemic. We've taken a big step in that right direction. Two thirds of students getting their first or reserve place at university, and that is great. And for those students who haven't quite got the grades that they were hoping for, and that happens every year, there's a whole range of support both at school, university and at clearing to help them get onto a great course for them. Executive head teacher at My Online Schooling, Rob Leach, told GB News one off exams aren't the best way to test young people. The current cohort of students have had a really tough time this year. And yet, as a system, we've gone back to the pre pandemic status quo when it comes to these high stake, cliff edge, one off set piece examinations, which can uh, give students grades to stay with them for life and perhaps are not the most accurate way of measuring how ready they are to embrace the opportunities. The Secretary General of the RMT Union has warned that strike action will continue until a settlement is reached. More than 40,000 rail workers have walked out today and will again on Saturday in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. Public transport in London will also be affected by industrial action tomorrow. Mick Lynch says threats from the Department for Transport are unhelpful.
Well, he's threatened at the weekend to make all our people redundant, issuing Section 188 forms, getting rid of all the guards on the trains. He's, they want to close all the booking offices in the country so that people can't uh, buy their tickets and get assistance. So there's all sorts of problems and the rhetoric is going up. What I think Grant Shop, Shaps needs to do is calm down and allow the railway executives, the managers of these companies, to reach a deal with us uh, in collective negotiations, which I think we could do. Well, in response, the Department for Transport says we urge union bosses to do the right thing by their members and let them have their say on Network Rail's very fair deal, which will deliver the reforms our rail system urgently needs. MP Margaret Ferrier has pleaded guilty to breaching COVID regulations in September 2020. At Glasgow Sheriff Court this morning, she admitted travelling by train between Scotland and London despite being told to self-isolate. She also admitted to willfully exposing people to the risk of infection, illness and death. Sentencing has been deferred until September. A 44-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder following the stabbing of Thomas O'Halloran in West London. The 87-year-old grandfather was stabbed to death whilst riding his mobility scooter in Greenford on Tuesday. Former Labour MP Stephen Pound paid tribute to his former constituent, describing him as a huge character. He'd sit there holding court in the cafe op opposite Tesco's in Greenford and it was like his mobility scooter was like a throne because he'd be sitting there and people would be coming up and he'd give bits. He, when I was an MP, he used to give me lots of advice and not always advice that I wanted, <laughs> you know, but he was always there. Mm. And such a high profile, sweet gentleman who the last thing he did on earth before he was killed was to raise money for Ukrainian refugees in eating. That was his last act. Three people have been killed, including a teenager, in severe storms in Corsica. 45,000 homes have been left without electricity after hurricane-force winds hit the French island. A 13-year-old girl was killed when a tree fell at a campsite. A 72-year-old woman died when her car was struck by a beach hut roof. And the third victim was killed when a tree fell on a house. The mother of 12-year-old Archie Battersby is campaigning for a new law named after her son. Holly Dance is calling for a change to the system regarding end-of-life cases. Archie's family made multiple court appeals to continue his treatment, but he died on the 6th of August after being taken off life support. Speaking to GB News for the first time since her son's death, Holly said cases like Archie's are taking their toll on families. There's been another... Um, baby, his life support was withdrawn two days after Archie. There's another case that was in court yesterday. It's the stress yeah. placed on us by the system. It's something's got to change. We've written to the health secretary, so moving forward to see what we can change. Um, I think the whole thing that you're rushed into court, that's got to change. And scientists have found evidence of an asteroid crater beneath the North Atlantic Ocean believed to be 66 million years old. It's thought to have crashed down around the same time as the asteroid that wiped out dinosaurs. Researchers think the crater found off the coast of Guinea in West Africa was caused by a 400 metre wide asteroid. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Alex with We Need to Talk About. know who should go on strike? Strikers. They should strike from striking, or at least do something to make strikes more interesting. If half the country are going to be forced to while away summer not being able to get anywhere or be herded onto platforms like cattle, at least strikers should organise some kind of union-backed flash mob and sell their woes in the form of interpretive dance. A bit of freestyle rap, perhaps, about why we still need ticket booths that only sell one journey an hour. A dance routine of Do the Locomotive or an a cappella version of Nine Till Five. That way, they could get a smidgen of public sympathy and maybe actually get somewhere with their ongoing industrial action. Well Well, let's talk now to our national reporter, Paul Hawkins, who's at Euston Station in London. Paul, what's the latest news from Euston? 
Uh, the latest news is, uh, frankly, as you were, uh, really, these two sides, uh, the train operating companies, Network Rail, uh, the union, uh, sorry, the train operating companies and Network Rail and the government on one side, the unions on the other, and neither side is budging in this dispute. Now, I've just spoken to the TSSA. They say that the train operating companies uh, aren't even opening any sort of negotiations. There are no plans for any discussions at the moment with the unions. Uh, the, they also say that the uh, train operating companies aren't allowed to put a deal on the table uh, because the government is stopping them. The government and the train operating companies would, of course, deny that. In terms of network rail, there is an offer on the table. It's the one from last month. It's the one that says you can have 4% pay, but with terms and conditions attached, uh, terms and conditions such as uh, move some workers moving to working only night shifts, which the unions say, look, our members never signed up for that. It's really bad for their health. We're not agreeing to that. That's just one of the changes in the terms and conditions that they're agreeing to. The government, on the other hand, say, look, the unions uh, are, are being, quote, unquote, militant. They're run by, quote, unquote, barons, that um, they're holding the country to ransom, that they need to modernise uh, and get with the programme, literally, in some cases. But unions are saying, no, 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 this is about getting fair pay for our members. And certainly in terms of the public's attitude on this, this is an issue that's affecting everyone. Everyone is saying they need a pay increase. So it does feel like there is some sympathy with some of the strikers amongst the members of the public. This isn't a time of low interest rates, low inflation, and you've got train workers who are asking for pay rises. This is a time of very high inflation, rising interest rates, budgets are severely squeezed. And so people hear why the train workers are uh, striking and there is some sympathy towards them there. Now, listening to Andrew Haynes, who's the chief executive of Network Rail, he says the discussions are slow, they're painful, moving all over the place, lack of clarity in how to resolve it, shifting goalposts, we are desperate to resolve it. Uh, and frankly, the desperation to resolve it, that's about the only thing that both sides have in common. Uh, you, speaking to Mick Lynch today, he said that this dispute's going to carry on for as long as it's necessary, although he stopped short of calling a general strike. We're talking about industrial action from teachers. We know uh, raw male workers are going on strike. Union uh, nurses are going to be balloted on strike action as well. He's not talking about a general strike, as we had in the past, but he has said that uh, the UK could be brought by a stands uh, to a standstill by a wave of strikes hitting every sector of the economy. So this dispute itself is going to rumble on for some time and it could spill out into more areas of the economy over the next few months. Paul, thank you very much. Paul Hawkins there, our national reporter. Well, joining me in the studio throughout the show today is former Labour advisor Scarlett Maguire. Scarlett, I think everyone's hoping that these strikes will end soon, but can you see any light at the end of the train tunnel? <laughs> well, I mean, why isn't the government negotiating? I mean, that's the first thing. If you look at the... I mean, it's boring for you people going on strike, but actually the thing about the strikers is they lose money every day. You don't go on strike unless you are really, really cross. They've had, you know, two years of no, of, of, uh, of no pay, uh, pay increase, and now they're being offered something that is, is well below inflation and they're being told they have to change the way they work and they're being told that thousands, but they don't know how many will be made redundant. So you can understand the union and God, are they backed? I mean, it's, it's you know, it was balloted. It, it, it was a massively overwhelming thing. It's about time. I mean, Grant Shapps will not meet them, right? Tells the rail people that they can't, they can't negotiate properly. And, and it's not done. Of course, what we should do is we should have it. Now, Mersey Rail, which isn't government owned, has, has negotiated 7% pay rise. It's over. But is there not a risk here, Scarlett, that, you know, if, if these strikers are seen to have been appeased by the government, and I do agree with you, but Grant Shapp seems to want to, you know, like a magician with, with a distraction thing, <laughs> to like number plates on bicycles. I know. So don't look in this direction, please. <laughs> but, you know, it, if he is seen to appease these particular set of strikers, is there not a risk that this will then sort of cascade out into other sectors thinking, well, they got their own way, we need to get our own way too. And it's a cost so, Come on, 7% seven, seven is still well below inflation, right? I mean, these... The the, 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 the the Mersey Rail uh, agreement is is not inflation busting. I mean, meanwhile, you know, I, 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 I look on the internet today and PwC are giving all their top people an extra million, right? I mean, a 12 per cent rise. I mean, they're, they're, so who is appeasing? There is a real problem about cost of living. We know there's a real problem about cost of living. People are really frightened and wages are stagnating 
appeasing and they're not keeping up. It's not about appeasing. It's actually about having a serious saying, OK, this is what we're going to do. Instead of saying, oh, no, we hate strikes and barons are holding us all to, all to ransom, actually saying, OK, we are, we are at a time of high inflation. How are we going to deal with it as a country? And that's not what the government's doing. Yeah, perhaps the government's soundbite department should be the thing that goes on strike. <laughs> I want to know your views. You sympathise with the strikers. Do you think Grant Shapps is taking this seriously enough? As your day being disrupted by yet again not being able to get on a train? Email me gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us your experiences at gbnews. Now, every year, the Norwegians send us a ruddy great Christmas tree to stick in Trafalgar Square to say thanks for helping them in the Second World War. It's been a gift from Oslo every year since 1947 after their king fled Nazi occupation and organised the resistance from London. Well, it would be nice to see Norway back our own resistance against Putin's warmongering. With war in Europe again, what would really help is some cut price gas. The UK imports 40% of its energy from Norway, who are raking it in at $400 a barrel. 10 times more than a decade ago. And with a population of just over 5 million, Norway surely has some room to manoeuvre. It would stop Putin profiting from sky-high prices and help end European malaise over arming Ukraine while countries face monster energy bills. If I was Liz Truss, I'd be on the next flight out to Oslo. Well, meanwhile, back here, an Ofgem director has resigned, saying the energy regulator is not doing enough to help households plunged into the brink of destitution when the price cap is to be lifted again this winter. Joining me now on the show is Malcolm Grimston, who's the Senior Research Fellow at the Energy Centre for Energy Policy and Tech at Imperial College. And we're also joined by Joe Malinowski, who's the founder of The Energy Shop. Starting first with you, Malcolm. I mean, it's still dismal news, this energy price cap. One in five households expected to be plunged into fuel poverty. Is this situation going to alleviate any time soon, do you think? I think it entirely depends on what the new government or new prime minister uh, decides to do about it. There's very little we can do about international oil and gas prices. Uh, so it's a matter of how do we get help to those who are in most uh, need immediately. Frankly, for people who are fortunate enough, uh, as I am, to be able to pay higher energy prices, then there are advantages in that. It means we take energy efficiency more seriously and it creates money for the next level of investment, which will bring prices down in the long term. But uh, I think that one in five estimate may well prove to be on the low side. There are many, many people, even in the summer when we don't use much energy, having a lot of difficulty paying their bills. Come the winter, when there's the double whammy of increased use because it's cold and the increased price cap, there are going to be many people in dire straits. And we really must make sure that money is getting directly to them. Uh, to tide them over however long this goes. And it could be a matter of two or three years before we see energy prices coming back to the sort of levels that we might have expected before. Two or three years, Joe. How on earth are people going to manage that? Oh, sorry, are you talking to me? Yes, Joe, go for it. Oh, hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I hope people are going to manage this. I, I think they're um, uh, very limited options. Um, uh, firstly, you've got to focus on getting your usage down. And I would actually expect once you start seeing energy bills into next year, not the October cap, which is going to three and a half, probably we're going into £4,000 next year. Once you start seeing effectively a quadrupling of energy bills, I would expect energy demand to be savagely cut, um, 10 to 20%. Uh, the second thing is the um, uh, is uh, you, you're really now hoping and praying for government bailouts for a lot of people. It's really quite degrading. It's quite demeaning. But you know that that's that's what that's going to be one of the main options for people who are vulnerable and can't afford it. Uh, but the third one, and this comes back to you know the Ofgem story, um, is um, Ofgem is just not doing enough to start to open up the market so consumers have a release valve. So they can actually start taking their own actions to see if they can get a better deal. That market's been shut now since at least last September, and there's no imminent signs that Ofgem is doing anything remotely uh, to bring that back into um, uh, bring that back into operation. 
And Malcolm, back to you. I mean, you said two or three years more this crisis could go on. I mean, in that time, is there anything the government can do to get more energy sources domestically online or find a you know, different, cheaper provenance elsewhere? Well, re reduction in energy use is extremely important and a, uh, an emergency programme of, of uh, insulation of the uh, most leaky houses certainly would be something that I think the government could and should uh, get involved in. We've already seen, to, to, to give the government credit, that some money has been targeted through, for example, the uh, lowest council tax bans, money which is likely to get to the least affluent in society. I'm very sceptical about price cuts, which are, uh, sorry, tax cuts, which really affect the middle income, uh, help middle income owner, uh, earners, but not the very poor. And funnily enough, I think the criticism of Ofgem recently has been that it's actually allowed far too many companies to come into the supply market without checking if they have the financial backing to deal with the sort of uh, turbulence that we've seen over the last six months. And as a result, over 30 of those companies have gone uh, broke probably costing consumers around £3 billion collectively as they've had to move. Uh, Ofgem, I, sadly, I don't think has been fit for purpose. But if anything, it's because they've been too keen on promoting apparent competition without recognising that competition works if the companies that are doing the competing are sound financially and are taking decisions that can protect them from bad times. And Ofgem let an awful lot of companies into the market that frankly should not have been let in, have now gone bust and are costing consumers a fortune. And um, briefly, Joe, I mean, if anybody is looking at their gas bill or coming to the end of their contract and thinking, I might fancy switching supplier to do something about it, are there any options left on the table? Uh, yes, there are options. Unfortunately, in a market where the energy price cap lags what's happening in wholesale markets is those options for um, new customers are, um, are already in the £4,000 Tire range, so they're not, you know, currently they're nowhere near the two thousand you're paying at the moment. They're not even the close to three and a half that you're going to be paying from October. They're already at um, two thousand and twenty-three levels. However, however, there are possibilities that if you are an existing customer of a company and you are in a vulnerable situation, that companies are selectively offering out much cheaper deals to selected customers. We've seen some of these prices come out. We're not quite sure who, where, or where. Or, or when, or uh, why you can, how you, who can get them. But certainly, if you are in that category, it is worth giving your company a call and seeing if there is any possibility they can put you on some kind of deeply discounted tariff or a discounted tariff. The, the critical thing to bear in mind is here: there is no point paying at this point um, more than the three and a half thousand pounds a year annualised that you are going to be paying from around about October. So that's one benchmark to look. And number two, make sure you don't get locked in uh, with a massive exit penalty. Um, because when the, the way the price cap has been changed, I mean, it would take a bit of a miracle for prices to collapse. But if we do get a miracle and prices do collapse, you don't want to suddenly start feeling you're locked into three and a half or four, three and a half thousand pound bill with a, with a 500 pound exit fee to get out of it. So but if, if you're in that situation, by all means, try and give your company a call, explain the situation and see not what can they do about you, about just you know, possibly loaning you money, but actually um, uh, maybe deferring payments and see if they can get you on a much cheaper deal if, pos if possible. Uh, I wouldn't hope too many hopes have, but it might be. It might be possible. Malcolm Grimston, Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Energy Policy and Tech at Imperial College, and Joe Malinovsky, who's the founder of The Energy Shop. Thank you so much for talking to me on this subject today. Scarlett, all I keep hearing when we're discussing the energy crisis is a load of coulda, woulda, shoulda. Well, we should have divested more in wind, in solar, in nuclear power stations. We should have been getting fracking, North Sea, or da-da-da-da-da. But in the middle of a crisis, not a single sod has been cut for a new power station, not a single single flight to Oslo to say to, to Norway, well, can you help us out a bit more? Is everyone doing anything about well, this? No, I mean, not a single meeting has been had. I mean, of course, what should have happened about two weeks ago <laughs> or tomorrow is Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson, the three people who are supposed to be running this government, should get together and say, this is what we're going to do. It's, we, the word is crisis. I mean, we talk about it every day and then we're told, 
Or will there be an emergency budget sometime in September? Meanwhile, what we know is people are really, really frightened and they don't know what to do. And, you know, most people, many, many people do not have £3,000 for, for the energy bill. They don't know what they're going to do this winter. And then when you... The money that is being given out is, is... It's all... Different authorities do it. So in Dorset, it's being given out by the Citizens Advice Bureau. My sister works for them. And, and three people turned up and said, well, we're pensioners. We hear we can get £200 each. And she shamed them into going away, that they didn't deserve the £200. There were people who did. I mean, it is... So the money that is around that we keep hearing about is chaotic and it's not being given to the right people. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm fattening my cat up for Christmas to use her <laughs> as a hot water bottle. I think that's the only option left. <laughs> Coming up on the show, the number of migrants arriving in the UK this year tops 20,000. GB News has been investigating why French authorities fail to stop small boats setting off on the perilous journey across the channel. Exclusive report coming up. You don't want to miss it. Time for a short break now. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. You're with Alex Phillips on GB News. Now, as the number of small boats crossing the channel this year tops 20,000, GB News has witnessed the cat and mouse tactics between French police and migrants as authorities face an almost impossible task of mounting effective patrols over the many miles of French coastline. Over days of filming, our team saw police using beach buggies to intercept groups of migrants be before dispersing them with tear gas. But the criminal gangs are simply regrouping and making a dash for the sea again the second the police move off to chase other groups of migrants further down the beach. Our home and security editor, Mark White, has this exclusive report. Pushing off from the northwest coast of France, the latest group of Channel migrants attempting to cross into UK waters. Our drone footage perfectly illustrates how every inch of space on this small boat is taken up with its human cargo. We counted 50 people clambering on board this inflatable, some struggling to get to the boat as it picks up speed. Look, 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 he's running, he's running, he's running back. 
We're at Graveline between Calais and Dunkirk, one of the people smugglers' favoured locations for attempting the crossing. Over days of filming, we witnessed the cat and mouse tactics of the police and migrants. From what we saw, French authorities are trying to stop the crossings, using beach buggies to try to intercept groups as they emerge from the dunes. Firing tear gas to disperse the migrants. But in truth, despite some successes, there are far too many miles of coastline here for police to mount a fully effective presence. And although these groups are often chased back into the dunes, the people smugglers simply marshal them again, and when the police move down the beach to chase their next group, they make a dash for the sea. The local lifeguards have become used to multiple daily small boat launches. They're not officially allowed to intervene, but have helped when the boats get into difficulties. It's sad, you know, we see uh, children, we see a uh, man with his wife, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's dangerous. So. The evidence of these migrants is everywhere around here. Discarded clothing littering the shoreline and the dunes along this tourist beach. The local tour guide says it's not just a UK and French issue, that the European Union has to do more. I went to swimming and uh, I saw a boat, uh, a long boat uh, with, uh, I don't know how many people in there and uh, we were a little, a little bit shocked. I was um, scared for them because uh, they were very, um, they were too much on the boat. As concerning as the small boat crisis undoubtedly is for those in the UK, particularly in Kent, for people living here along the northwest coast of France, the impact is huge. In this supermarket car park in Dunkirk, we found this group of Eritreans just sitting around drinking Jack Daniels and smoking cannabis in broad daylight, waiting here until their next attempt to get to the UK. Do you know anyone in the UK? 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 I have UK for me. I have UK. You know people? Yeah, I people have more, more, UK more for me. The people's smuggling industry is big business for the criminal gangs, who can net millions of pounds a day. They've become expert at reading the prevailing tide and weather conditions. These life jackets are hardly even hidden among the dunes, waiting for the next group to grab them as they attempt to cross. And we discovered personal papers and other documents discarded by the migrants on the instructions of the people smugglers to make identifying them more difficult for UK authorities. Among the papers, application forms for asylum in countries including Belgium. Further down the beach, more evidence of the French police tactic of slashing and puncturing these inflatables if they can get to them in time. But although some of those initial attempts are frustrated, the vast majority of small boats and their human cargo make it across the English Channel. More than 20,500 so far this year. To add to the tens of thousands, who've already entered the UK asylum system. Mark White, GB News. Well, joining me now in the studio is GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White. Fantastic report there, Mark. The numbers just keep going up and up, don't they? Yes, uh, end of that report says 20,500 have crossed. It's now up to 21,100. Another 606 people crossed yesterday in 12 small boats because the weather conditions uh, to Qatar for the better, which allowed these small boats to get across the channel. And uh, every day they do what I was describing there as a, a cat and mouse operation with the police. Here we can see uh, the vision there of the tear gas that's being fired. But the fact is there are hundreds of square miles of these dunes and coastline uh, that the police have to guard. And they just don't, even with very significant resources, have enough to properly, effectively cover the coastline. So while they may be chased back into the dunes, 
It's only a matter of time before the police move on further down the beach and it only takes them one minute to get from the dunes into the water. So by the time, even in their speedy buggies, by the time they get back, then clearly they've got into the water. Mm. No, it's, uh, well, people often criticise the French for not doing enough. At least we've shone a light on uh, what they are up to with our cash. Uh, Mark, thank you ever so much. Let me know your views. Do you think the French are doing enough? Email me gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Coming up on the show, it's A-level results day. As if you didn't know, full of highs, but also some lows as the overall pass rate has fallen since last year. In need of some advice, we'll be speaking to some career experts. So don't go anywhere now, though. It's time for a check on the news headlines. Good afternoon, it's 2.34. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Top grades for A-level results in England, Wales and Northern Ireland have fallen since last year. They do, however, remain higher than pre-pandemic levels. Meanwhile, the number of students accepted onto degree courses has also fallen, according to UCAS, but it is still the second highest rate on record. Former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, Sir Anthony Selden, told GB News it's right that grade inflation is down. Uh, grade inflation, like inflation, household in the country knows at the moment is is not good. I mean, inflation uh, devalues what has gone before. Um, so there's no doubt that it's right to get uh, the percentages of grades back to where it was before COVID. Uh, that's right. But it's also true to say that it is a big uh, hit on this current generation. Well, the Queen's granddaughter, Lady Louise Windsor, is among those who've received their results today. And Buckingham Palace says she'll attend St Andrews University. The 18-year-old daughter of the Earl and Countess of Wessex will start her course in English in September. And she'll follow in the footsteps of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who both went to the university where they first met. The Secretary-General of the RMT Union says there'll be waves of public sector workers joining in with strike action amid rising inflation and falling wages. Rail, tube and bus passengers face further travel disruption amid three days of industrial action. 80% of train services will be affected today as more than 40,000 workers walk out in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. A 44-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder following the stabbing of Thomas O'Hanoran in West London. The 87-year-old grandfather was stabbed to death whilst riding his mobility scooter in Greenford on Tuesday. Police say the arrest was made as a result of the CCTV images released yesterday. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. It's back to Alex with We Need to Talk About in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. can promise anyone clutching their A-level results today that in about 12 months' time, they really don't matter as much. That's because whatever assemblage of letters make up your grades right now, you'll either be at university focusing on your, focusing on your first year exam results next year, or life will have opened another door for you. Some 20,000 kids didn't get into their first choice, of course. But with some 30,000 spaces available, the great game of academic musical chairs has begun. Like all the spanners life throws into the works as you begin adulting, dodgy results is just one life challenge to master. With joining me first on the show is Carolyn Parry, who's the president of the Career Development Institute, founder, director and lead coach at Career Alchemy. Carolyn, if you're one of the people who didn't get the grades they were hoping for today, what should their next steps be? I think the very first thing, Alex, is just to take a breath and to recognise how much they have achieved, um, because they won't have failed in every area. They'll have had a couple that didn't go the way, the way they wanted to. And making a decision when you're under pressure is not always the best thing to do. So chill down a little bit, take a breath and go and get some expert help. There are people all around the country, members of the Career Development Institute, wearing badges like the badge I've got on today, uh, which shows that you are a professional career uh, expert who's trained and experienced. And we are all around the country here to help people make better choices rather than stumbling into something, to use your musical chairs analogy, finding they haven't got a chair to sit on. Make sure it's the right chair. So that's what I'd suggest. Take a breath and then go and get professional help. There is definitely a future for every single person out there. If there are people out there who haven't got the results they wanted, maybe just feel like giving up and think, oh, never mind, I'll just enter the world of work. I mean, that's a perfectly viable option as well, isn't it? So would you uh, encourage people to look into doing resits? I would suggest that what people need to do is to understand the direction they want to go in, and then that will tell them if they need to resit or not, or if they need to find a different route through. And as you say, university is not the be-all and end-all for everybody, and it's not necessary for all careers either. There are some careers where you have to have a degree, but for others, there aren't. And I think one of the most important things out of all of this that I can say is that what's happened to you today does not define your future unless you let it happen to you. So take some control, take some action, go get help, and then you'll be able to take your next step, whether that's into further training, whether that's university, a, de a degree apprenticeship, whether it's a normal apprenticeship, whatever that might be, but go and take some action, get some help from a professional. There is a future out there for every one of the young people who might be feeling a little disappointed and disheartened today. Don't, dust yourself off, get back up, and there will be a future that we will help you to achieve. I mean, I'd imagine there's a lot of people out there who didn't get their results, who have been sitting on the phone to Clearing and UCAS um, for the last few hours. Is there a risk that there's a bit of a mad scramble in these circumstances and people aren't able, just because of the way the system's set up, to do what you're saying, which is to take stock of the situation before they jump into their next move? There is a risk there. Um, what they might find is that they can get into the same university they wanted to get into, but on a different course. So that's worth exploring. Contact the admissions tutor at the university you want to get into um, and have a conversation. But you have to do that. You have to be absolutely clear about who you are, what you have to offer and why you want to go to that university and be a good student there. And also, what could you bring to that university life? So the extracurricular things as well, whether that's music or sports or whatever, to show that you are going to be committed. Because what worries you universities and why they reject people is the fear of somebody not being successful or worse still dropping out. Uh, so make sure you know who you are and why you want to go down that route and get on the phone and argue your case. This is a lifelong skill that I'm sure you've used lots of times, Alex, to get yourself the opportunities you've had through your career. Start learning those skills now. They're strong career management skills that will help people in the future, no matter where they are, through their 50-year career, because that's realistically what we're looking at. 
Carolyn, thank you so much. I wish they could clone you and put you in every single school hall today. What amazing, solid advice there. Hustle is the message from Carolyn Parry, president of the Career Development Institute. Well, joining me in the studio is Sophie Atwood, who's a PR consultant and managing director of Sophie Atwood Communications. I mean, Sophie, your focus is on actually looking forward, even if you've got the results, even if you're going to university. The next three years are going to be critical, and a lot of people might be getting drunk at Freshers' Week, and the photo are going on Facebook and on Instagram and then down the line, uh-oh. Yeah, I think social media now, it's, it's so prevalent and we there's an immense pressure for everyone to have an online footprint. And I think it's just time for everyone now, especially for A-level students, but everyone as a whole, to take a moment, pause, have a look at their social media and think how's that going to impact them in the future. I mean, more and more, when people are going for job interviews, the, the, the people who might be potentially about to employ them are going to do a deep dive into the sort of things you might have posted, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I was having a look at some statistics the other day and one in five employers have, have said that they've actually been put off by a candidate um, if they've kind of had any bad behaviour on their social media. And, and that boils down to, I think, 70% were impacted by alcohol um, and drug abuse online, but even 20% of them were impacted by vanity online. So it just kind of goes to show the impact that your social media persona can have on all of those progression points throughout your career and, and your life. But social media can also be a, a, a massive boon, can't it? Because for some people, it can really act as their shop window, especially, say, if you wanted to pursue a career in, well, media, like I do. I mean, I'm not really on social media. I don't care for it that much. But in this day and age, you kind of need to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're talking to someone who survives with social media and advises clients to have that online footprint. I think that one of the things that I could say to people now is to maybe take a breath, have a look at their existing socials, maybe look at a social media audit to just kind of clear the way for a really positive um, springboard now for the future. And then moving forward, it's just about making sure that everything online, you're always thinking about having a personal brand rather than having it as a social setting. It's very, very difficult because this generation of students have, in effect, grown up with social media. So there's no distinction, really, between friendship, how they communicate with their friends and their social lives, but then also how they then blend that into a personal brand to allow them to access those, those goals and objectives that they have. Um, but, yeah, the, the social media is very important, but done in the correct way. Sophie, great advice and great advice earlier from Carolyn as well. So it's time for you to roll up Scarlett and give your great advice. I actually, I think it's fantastic. Like, the thing about the social media is, is it, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, that my daughter said, I, I wouldn't want you to see it. And you think, well, if you don't want me to see it, who else is seeing it? So actually really boring. If you've got a problem with your parents seeing it, it shouldn't be on social absolutely. media. I absolutely agree with you about branding, but let's be sensible. I mean, people lose a lot on social media. As far as Caroline's concerned, she is so right. I mean, just take a breath and think, is this what I really want to do? Or is this what I, I was being expected to do? And, and tomorrow, as you say, in a year's time, your life will be completely different. The a, the a, I talk to somebody who really did badly in my A-levels. Um, your A-levels won't matter for the rest of your life. That is very true. Sophie, Caroline, uh, Caroline, call you Caroline and Scarlett. <laughs> and, of course, Caroline, who we spoke to earlier down the line. But thank you all so much for your candid advice. Let me know your views. Have you got kids who've done their A-levels today? Did they get the results they wanted? Did you completely flunk yours and now you're a multi-millionaire? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, as war rages in Ukraine, tensions are mounting elsewhere in Europe with flare-ups between Serbia and Kosovo. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg held separate meetings yesterday with Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic and Kosovo's Prime Minister Albin Kurti, with EU-facilitated talks between the two leaders again today. The friction is over an enclave of Serbs in northern Kosovo who don't regard the country as independent and brandished firearms and put up roadblocks over laws about all vehicles having to have Kosovan, not Serbian, number plates. 
Well, Kosovo's Prime Minister calls Vucic a little Putin, accusing him of being bent on invading Kosovo. And the ramping up of rhetoric is not a coincidence with war in Ukraine. Moscow has been surreptitiously stoking divisions within Bosnia, Montenegro, Serbia, Kosovo, North Macedonia and Albania for years. There is now chatter in the corridors of power around the world that the Balkans could be careering towards the next big war in Europe. Well, joining me now on the show is Donica Emini, who's the political analysis and director at Civicos Platform. Donica, can you give me a little more of an explanation about what's going on in Serbia and Kosovo? Thanks for having me. Of course, uh, there is fear of another potential conflict in the Balkans. We still remember the 90s. You all remember the 90s and the breakup, the violent breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, the tensions between Kosovo and Serbia are not new, although this time they are more complicated because we have the war in Ukraine and we have a clear barricading of Serbia aligning explicitly with Russia. It is very hard to find a country that is so explicitly uh, supporting Russia and what Russia is doing in Ukraine, right? So we have a country like Serbia in the middle of Europe, basically is the top candidate to join the EU, which is uh, refusing to align with or EU foreign policy and the sanctions towards Russia. And then, of course, we are having the Kosovo case, which is, of course, an unfinished project of the 90s because Kosovo is not uh, internationally recognized. It has always been an issue of fire between Russia and the West, being the US and the EU, as well as the EU facilitated dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia that you have mentioned previously. Uh, the current tensions basically reflect the failure of the EU to normalize relations between Kosovo and Serbia, although the dialogue has been ongoing for well, more than 10 years. What we are discussing now has been agreed between Kosovo and Serbia in 2011 and has been renegotiated over the time, but never actually provided a long-term sustainable agreement that would close the open disputes between the two countries. Now, with the war in Ukraine and the fact that Kosovo has NATO mission, like K4 in Kosovo, it is unlikely to believe that there is going to be a conflict, such as in the 90s, because for Serbia to open conflict with Kosovo, to intervene militarily in Kosovo, it would mean that it declares war to NATO, uh, because NATO is responsible for security in Kosovo. But diplomatically, the information warfare and everything that is going on, it's really making people think that the 90s are really behind the door. The NATO troops stationed in Kosovo seem to be keeping a plug on an otherwise volatile situation. But is the Kosovan prime minister right that actually it would be the wish of Serbia to invade Kosovo, do you think? Oh, that is uh, basically the rhetoric that Alexander Vucic, the president of Serbia, and his very much controlled media have been uh, putting out there. It is not the wish of Kurti or, or just a declaration of uh, Prime Minister Kurti. It is basically how Serbia acts around Kosovo. Serbia refuses to recognize Kosovo, and Serbia always uses Kosovo in relation to the West, but also to Russia, because this provides a political leverage for Alexander Vucic who has installed a very uh, dictatorship-like regime, unfortunately, in, in Serbia. Uh, this, uh, this statement comes after a series of uh, statements uh, that are sounding similar like those of Russian uh, uh, officials uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, and this is basically the fear that not just citizens of Kosovo are fearing, but uh, also the ones in Bosnia and Herzegovina, because both countries have uh, very open uh, disputes and tensions uh, with Serbia. This statement comes after uh, the fact that in last November, it was the Russian ambassador in Serbia, uh, hand in hand with Alexander Vucic, visiting the military base, which is South Serbia, very close to the Kosovo border, and the military jets actually flying over the border, in spite of the fact that there is an agreement which does not allow uh, Serbia to come close to the border. Yeah, Donica, I mean, it sounds like tensions are very much ramping up. Thanks for coming on and explaining it to us. Donica Emini there is political analyst and director of the Civicos platform.
Well, this year's British Motor Show is taking place in Farnborough. It is the largest car show in the UK since 2008, with 250 exhibitors and more than 25 manufacturers and loads of new vehicles being launched. And if that wasn't enough, there are stunt displays, supercars and, of course, priceless classics also on display. And here's another priceless classic, our GB News South East of England reporter, Ellie Costello. <laughs> Ellie, are you having fun? I'm jealous of you. I do like cars. <laughs> Hi Alex, yes, it's been the most incredible day here at the British Motor Show at the Farnborough International Exhibition Centre. It is actually the largest car show since 2008, as you said, 250 uh, exhibitions here, 25 manufacturers. There is so much to see and do. You can probably hear uh, all the test drives that are taking place behind me right now. There's a long queue for that going on behind me and I can just smell the smell of burning rubber from the tyres on the uh, track out there. There's lots of people here and really loving what they're seeing. I'm sat right now, if you're listening on the radio, in a 620R Caterham in this lovely green colour. Now, if you like the look of this one, Alex, it's going to set you back £63,000. Uh, so not exactly a cheap investment. You really do have to love your cars. But I was speaking to the chief operating officer of Caterham Cars earlier, and he was saying that for the first time here at the British Motor Show, the Caterham cars are running on biofuel. They're trying to do their bit for the environment. He says it's the way that the industry is going. So certainly lots of very serious conversations going on here about the future of the motor industry. There is going to be more of a focus on sustainable fuels and also on electric vehicles. So there's serious conversations, but of course there's lots of fun as well. And I was out earlier having a test drive in a Caterham. Let's have a look at how it went. And this is Sam. She's going to be the driver today. She's a much better driver than I am a passenger, I think. Oh, it's low. Hello. Ah! Very ah! Ah! if you were listening on radio. I didn't manage to actually say any words. I was so scared. But uh, if you love your cars, Alex, this is the place to be and it's on till Sunday. Girl, that's just me parking at Sano's later tonight when I go do my grocery shop. Ellie, I'm super jealous. I do love a good car. Ellie Costello there having a heck of a lot of fun at the car show. Well, that's all I've got time for before I do my uh, donuts and my handbrake turns at um, the local supermarket. Join me again for We Need to Talk About on GB News. Same time, you know it, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up next, it's The Briefing with Tom Harwood. First of all, it's time for the weather forecast. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful afternoon. Hi there, Aidan McGiven here with the latest forecast from the Met Office. A lot of cloud across the UK today and that cloud bringing some outbreaks of rain towards the west. But in the south and the southeast, it's mostly dry, just a few showers, certainly a lot calmer compared with recent days activities. A weather front is moving into west and northwestern areas. That's bringing the thicker cloud and some showery outbreaks of rain. So for Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's already been a damp start and that rain now moving into Northern England, North and West Wales, and some of it turning up into Cornwall later. Most of it's light and on and off. It will be more moderate over hills and it will be turning more showery later. A few showers also in East Anglia, but these not as heavy as recent days. Sunshine in between, 26 Celsius, the high in the southeast with low 20s further north and northwest or high teens. Some moderate to heavy showers crossing Scotland overnight and then the main area of rain pushes into central and southern parts of the UK. Again, turning more showery, some heavy downpours by the morning, particularly towards East Anglia. 17 Celsius in the southeast, so reasonably warm, but clearer spells further northwest and so a fresher night to come and 